Maggie and the rest of the survivors prepare to defend against the coming assault of Simon and the Saviors. Little they know, most of the dying is going to come after the fight. It's the Battle of Hilltop on this week's The Walking Dead, Season 8, Episode 13. Do not send us astray. Hey everyone, D here, and welcome to this week's review of The Walking Dead. So yes, your standard spoiler warning applies. All right, so The Battle of Hilltop. We've been sort of expecting this. We've been moving towards this. We've got Simon with his group of saviors, Sans Negan, and a bunch of tainted weapons ready at this point to wipe out Maggie and the remaining survivors. So on the surface, this is a big episode, a lot going on, a lot of things to happen. In actuality, as much as I wanted to be really excited about it, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of of two minds on this episode, to be honest. Um, there was some great action, there was some great stuff moving forward, but some dumb moments too, some whining and just, I don't know, it just, um, it, it, it seems messy. And to me, that's not really quality writing when I get the feeling of, of everything is messy and things done just to sort of get a rise out of people. Um, specifically, I mean, we could start off with uh, Dr. Dana, who there in the beginning is giving Sadiq a hard time. And I don't know if we've seen her before. I don't remember her. It certainly stood out for me of like, who the hell is this person yelling at Sadiq? Because I thought the whole issue was, they didn't have a doctor! And now we've got this person yelling at Sadiq about amputations and surgery and doing the right thing. Maybe just be happy that there is someone there. And two years on, <laughs> after the zombie apocalypse, the walker apocalypse, if anybody is still alive, they can handle themselves. All right, unless you find some enclave out in the middle of nowhere, a bunch of nuns that have been locked behind a door and have never even looked outside the past two years. I'm going to pretty much assume that anybody you run into at this point can kind of handle themselves. Um, and, and I guess it was kind of annoying because once we saw her, it was like, who is she? I just started calling her Dr. Redshirt because, you know, at some point... She is going to die. That is why she is there, to give Sadiq a hard time and then to die. Which is, of course, exactly what she does. You see her at this one moment, and then the next time you see her, she's walking in the hospital like, oh, there's some blood on the ground. Ah! And that's it. I guess it's more like, ah! Uh, and that's it. So it's, it's little things like that. And, of course, Henry. Um... So let's, let's get into that, but let's get, jump into that via uh, Morgan, who starts off the episode seeing the ghost of Gavin. You should have done it. You should have done it. Referring to, I believe at that point, to uh, killing him. That it wasn't supposed to be little Henry that killed him. It was supposed to be Morgan that kills him. And I do like the idea of Gavin sort of popping out through this episode, sort of, well, haunting Morgan, because Morgan is kind of, his psyche is, is shattering here. He is breaking down. And I think most of Gavin's uh, uh, presence is really from a guilt standpoint um, of how much this is going to affect Henry. And, and I think, and I think that's sort of where he's going after. Now, now, when he's saying in the beginning, it should have been you. Yeah, it should have been Morgan that killed him. But when, more, uh, when uh, Gavin's going on later on with, uh, 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 you know what it is, I'm not entirely sure what he's referring to unless he's talking about a breakdown of his own psyche or perhaps that obsession, that death obsession, that murder obsession that sort of sank itself into Morgan, which is now manifesting into Henry. So I'm sure we'll probably get a little more clarification, but I think that's sort of where they're going with it. Um, because Henry was really annoying this episode. Uh, we do obviously get the foreshadowing at the beginning when he's looking down at the gun and asking to carry that. And of course we have everyone else, especially Carol. No, don't do it. You can't go outside. If you go out there, you're going to die. we got to protect you. At least at that point, they seem to be giving him the job of you have to protect the people in the house. 
I don't think they were clear with it, but I, I still think that's one of the big faults that they have had, that Carol has had, and even Ezekiel, in dealing with little Henry, is they haven't given him a job, really. They've been sort of loose about it. Yeah, he's got to protect people here, but they're not, they're not committing to that sort of idea. They're still trying to protect him, which, of course, allows him to do all of the stupid things that he did this episode. Okay, grabbing the gun. All right, big M16 laying around. Nobody misses that? I mean, I guess people are all wounded and everything afterwards, so I mean, that, it sort of makes sense. Uh, but what really annoyed me is when he went down to the prisoners to find out who killed his brother. Uh, I guess Morgan's story that, uh, that it was Gavin didn't, didn't totally take with him. Um, and the main reason that that really annoyed me, which is one of the messy parts that I'm talking about, is where's the guard? Please tell me that they always have a guard on the prisoners. I know people are wounded. I know that it's afterwards, but seriously, there's not a guard on these people. They could just climb the fence. They could break something. I mean, come on. It's, it just, that got to me. And then, of course, he unlocks it and walks in. You know, the minute that he does that, it's all going to fall apart and they're going to escape, which is exactly what happens. And now that people are going to be looking for him. Uh, I'm assuming probably when the Saviors took him, maybe as another prisoner. Um, I doubt that he just ran away. And I thought maybe Gregory did, but let's be honest. Gregory doesn't think of anybody else. Um, uh, I think that was sort of the point that was said to Maggie in the, in the episode, is Gregory is all about himself. And I really think he needs to die. I'm really, I mean, I'm, not a, I'm a pacifist kind of as a general person, but Gregory is just, he is just constantly a problem. He is just constantly causing trouble and really should not be around anymore. Um, but I, I get the feeling we'll, we'll, we'll see him again and he's still going to keep causing trouble. Now, the battle itself, um, again, ups and downs with that. I like some of the initial setup. I love the fact that they spiked the road to take out one of the trucks coming in. I thought that that was really, you know, I mean, there's a simple, smart thing right there. Take out so they can't ram the gates. Take out the vehicles. Very smart. Of course, you can just dig up and pull those away. Um, and then we had, I mean, let's be honest. One of my favorite movies is The Great Escape with Steve McQueen on the motorcycle, doing the jumps and all. So when we've got Daryl riding it up on the motorcycle with the machine gun, you know, cheesy? Yes. Kind of fun and exhilarating? Sure, I'll go with that. Uh, I certainly think they let... And this is, this is where things get messy. Again, there's a lot of good stuff in the battle. I mean, the idea that you've got the machine guns on, uh, uh, on the, the survivors on the hilltop side against what's basically a bunch of arrows and axes on the saviors. Very uneven looking. Uh, but, of course, the saviors there know that wounding is just as good, if not better, than killing at this point with all of their tainted weapons. Um, so, just from a visual standpoint, I thought that that was really cool. Um, now, when Daryl comes in, and they got the, the school bus comes in to close out the gate behind him, again, cool, good move, kind of further away from the opening of the gate, though. That opens things up to allow the saviors to come in, which you do, I guess. You want to you wanna pull them in. Um, but in that idea, they didn't seem to control the movement. Again, for all of the preparation, I didn't think they controlled the movement of the saviors all that well. I mean, we have uh, Simon and Dwight coming around and getting behind Tara there, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, um, which seemed to be an odd way of kind of getting around. Everything should sort of be narrowed up. Uh, I love the back and forth. Uh, the, sa the, the prisoners, uh, I noticed... Alden, by the way, is the name of the good prisoner. I finally looked that up. Now that he's done enough good stuff and seems to be on the side. So Alden is his name. I love that bit where Maggie and Simon are talking on the radio. And she's like, I got 38 prisoners. And Simon's like, I don't care. And then Alden's like, let me fight with you. Do you think I want to be with those guys anymore? <laughs> that was great. Uh, but... All of the prisoners were in the house. I think they were in order to control them, to keep them tightened off. If they were out in the pen, then potentially the saviors could have gotten out and rescued them, let them go, and then you would have just had, you know, 
<laughs> been adding to the numbers of the enemy. So I think that's why everybody seemed to have been pulled in the house, why we had Alden there and Long Red Hair, who also, like Gregory, needs to be killed. Um, but the battle and back and forth again, quick, messy as battles go, that's understandable. Now, when they pulled back, they took out all the lights. They got everything all dark. I was like, okay, what's going on here? We know that the good guys don't have, like, you know, night vision technology, so I was kind of curious where they were going. And this is one of the parts that really, really annoyed me. It stood out so much, I was just like, WTF. But I said the other thing. Um, and that is when it's all quiet and Simon is leading up the saviors, they're in one giant chunk right in front of the bus. They should have started shoot. All I was thinking of, snipers, where are the snipers? This would be the perfect time to snipe. So when they clicked on the lights and started firing, I was like, yeah, but not nearly enough people died as they should have. In fact, perhaps you should have started firing before you hit the lights. I think that was sort of to distract and maybe show. If it's, again, there's small technical things. You can go either way. But the fact that that huge group of people, most of them seem to be able to run away. I, I, I didn't catch the whole lot of the bodies dropping right there. And that seemed to have been the whole point. Again, it's, it's controlling the motion. Simon was stupid enough to keep everybody kind of together there. And he should have really paid a bigger price for that. Um, and instead, it just, I don't know, probably dropped a couple of people, but it shouldn't have gotten a few more. God, if Rosita had a couple more of those explosives, that would have been really nice right there. Pull them up to the house and boom! See, that, that would have been smarter planning. They've known all this time that the saviors were coming. They should have been able to control their numbers a little bit better. Um, I like that it did take up a, a chunk of time of the episode. It wasn't like five minutes ago. It was like 10, 15, almost, almost 20 minutes by the time the whole battle was over. Um, so I liked them spending the time on that. But there was just, there was a lot of these little moves that got kind of uh, uh, annoying for me. Now, Dwight being back with the Saviors, obviously a big point of contention between Tara and, and Daryl in this episode. And I... I have to say, I did like the conversation back and forth. How Tara really is at this point is kind of forgiven Dwight. I mean, maybe not forgiven. Like she said, she's always going to be mad at him. There's a part of her that's always going to hate. But she is willing to kind of move forward now. She has recognized that Dwight did save her and everybody else back in the swamp. Um, Daryl, of course, still hanging on to it, still angry. Really mean throwing out the whole Denise uh, tag there for Tara, but um, they're kind of back and forth. I think I, I just I thought that that was a good moment of kind of trying to deal and trying to figure out what side he's on and and where he's committing. Even even the whole point where Tara brings up her association with the governor, uh, and of course Merle being associated with the governor is that sometimes maybe where we started, who we met is going to help define. They were lucky to have find Rick and everybody else and they connect in with that group. They could have easily gone over to the Saviors being caught up in that, like Morales did, like five seconds before he got killed. Um, so I, I like that kind of approach, that kind of idea. The fact that Tara is, is, is really looking at that idea of it really depends on kind of where we were and where we might have been. I mean, Alden here, perfect example of somebody that got caught up with the Saviors and now has really been working constantly to try and break away from them. Um, even after the whole death bit, when, when Maggie comes down to have him uh, go and bury his friends, she's like, they're not my friends. I'm happy to see him like this, uh, but I'll go bury him. Uh, you know, again, it's who you're with doesn't necessarily define who you are as a person. Um, but I think it's really going to come forward where, of course, because Dwight shot Tara, shot her in the shoulder, shot her to keep Simon from hitting her. Simon was going to come up and do it, and Dwight pops up behind and shoots her in the shoulder, wounds her. And she's really going to realize it, or even Daryl might actually realize it, when she doesn't get sick. Because I don't think Dwight had any tainted weapons. And I think that's really, the, that's going to be the main point that kind of does that twist. 
Uh, because at the end of the episode, when they're talking with Tara and the, the whole, some of them have gotten hit and some of them turned, I'm not sure if they all realized it, but it, I, I think that's going to be the bit. And that's the one that I'm kind of waiting for, is when she realizes, hey, I got hit like everyone else, but everybody else who got hit got sick and turned, but I didn't. Who shot me? Dwight. Oh, it was just a wound. Maybe he did it. So they would look like he's on their side, but really isn't. So, I mean, that, I think that's really going to play it out. So, no, Tara isn't changing. Tara isn't going to turn. Dwight didn't poison his arrows. Um, now, the only damn thing with Dwight on that point there was I was thinking of, why not shoot Simon to the back of the head right there? You got him! And just... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming is that he probably still too much in the group would be afraid that he'd be turned right there, maybe not be able to get pulled over, maybe not immediately accepted by Hilltop in the middle of that battle and could end up getting shot himself. So his only real move is to try and help Hilltop by being on the other side. And I think that's really going to be the role that he's going to keep playing on. So Tara, I'm glad, will be open to seeing that. Daryl it's going to take a little more. And it end up, Daryl may end up killing Dwight, and that just is going to be the end of, of, of Dwight, and that's how he ends up going. Uh, but I am hoping, uh, of course, that, that Daryl sort of sees that being angry at Dwight isn't really... He's really more angry at himself being taken advantage of, I think Daryl is, uh, than necessarily really mad at Dwight. There's a lot of apologizing uh, about going after Negan on a few people's sides this episode. Also, uh, Rick especially, I guess, very upset that he tried and failed. Um, but I think, again, Rick is still dealing with the loss of Carl, which was like yesterday, day before. Still pretty damn fresh. Uh, that whole scene with him and Michonne in the house... All I'm thinking, you know, when Rick's trying to pull out the boards, you know, I had to turn off the power to save, uh, save gas. It's going to be hot. We need air. I think, to me, that was just Rick trying to keep himself busy. Keep busy, less chance to think about Carl, keep things going on. And, and I know here he's hitting on the fact that maybe he's preoccupied that he wasn't able to kill Negan, and that's why he wasn't in with the group, which is what really what Maggie wanted, Negan there with the Savior so she could take him out. Um, but I, I really think, again, this is a lot of, this is still Rick dealing with a lot of that, that Carl loss. And again, it's fresh. That makes sense. Uh, and I think that's really the main reasons why he and Sadiq were kind of hitting heads throughout this episode. I mean, first off, uh, he almost kills Sadiq when he runs into him there, right, in the middle of the battle, which is understandable. You know, a lot of bodies, a lot of moving, it's chaos. Uh, but at least Rick still has a sense about him to identify his target before he starts swinging the axe. Uh, which is good, because Sadiq's just trying to take care of the wounded there. Um, so that's kind of their first encounter, really in a way kind of like post-Carl, because again... Rick shows up in the middle of the battle. It's not like they've really had time to sort of deal with anything between the two of them. I mean, they do get that moment post-battle where Sadiq comes up to try and tend to Rick's wound and goes on about the whole prayer idea. But Rick, not really at a point to listen to it. I mean, I think there's a part of him that is always going to associate Sadiq with Carl's death. Uh, so I don't think he's really in that position to kind of move past that yet. Uh, however, in the midst of crisis, both of them do the right thing. And I think that was one of the, that was the great part. When we do have that battle inside the house, you know, we had Dr. Redshirt giving Sadiq the big uh, complaints about, have you ever done amputations or anything like this? And here in the midst of this battle, Goes, pushes the person down, grabs Rick, holds out the arm, and Rick's like, yeah, I know what to do. I mean, it was, it, it's kind of the perfect thing. And, and to me, it's, it's, this is the reality of dealing with issues. And it's one point that they really did well in this episode, specifically in this point, was, look, you may have a conflict with somebody, you may have a problem with them, but when it comes down to doing business, people just jump in and do what they need to do. 
They can set all of their personal stuff aside and do the thing. They got to work together. If they got to work together, they're going to listen to each other if they know that that's the right thing. And I think that was kind of the perfect little scene moment there is we have the conflicts with Rick almost killing. We have the doubt of Sadiq can do anything and we have their personal issues. But when it comes down to it and people are dying and you need to save lives, the two of them went right into sync. And that is something that I'm going to look forward to seeing develop uh, as things go forward. All right, now the second wave of death that went through Hilltop, of course, is when all of the wounded turn and start attacking everyone else, which I have to say, I did like the setup for that. How we have, honestly, the close-up on Tobin's breathing, I thought was perfect. It was just keeping that rhythm, keeping that vision of just, he's just hanging on, it's labored, it's held, and then... Okay, I wish that he had just stopped breathing. That <clears throat> before he died moment, eh, they, they, they really didn't need that. I think it would have been so much better if they had stuck with the breathing and then just panned to the clock. And then we catch that 40 minutes later, however it is, and then he gets back up. Uh, and then moves on. I, I liked him showing the clock, just sort of the idea of how long it was taking between the death and the rebirth and everything. Um, and so, yes, that was cool. It shows the whole turning idea, people waking up in the midst of the house and going after everyone else. Uh, really cool. Honestly, my favorite part of that, uh, the guy that was talking to Maggie beforehand when he wakes up uh, about uh, Gregory always being for himself, uh, when he turns and gets up and starts down the steps and just falls and then down and then gets back up. I thought that was perfect. Because I was like, what? The walker's going to try and negotiate those steps? Boom. Oh, no, he's not. Okay. No, that was, that was perfect. That, that was a cool moment. Uh, and, of course, the panic and attack and everything. All uh, understandable. I would have thought that, again, Walking Dead there would be a little bit more of an awareness of anybody wounded that something could happen and, and turn. And again, this is where I talk about messy. It is great to see all of this happen uh, and, and to have the walkers rise up and, and, and take out more people. Um, I just, again, it's one of those things where there seems to be kind of like we go from smart to stupid to smart to stupid and not pay attention to these things. If you have wounded, you have to keep them in the right place. If somebody dies, if there's a complication, if anything goes on, you can't have them all mixed up in the middle of this giant room with everybody else. Just, I guess there's got to be some new protocols for Hilltop and everyone else going forward. So, I mean, that was the one thing that kind of got to me. Um, but otherwise, again, I, I did like that whole idea and concept of not paying attention and these people you think are wounded are getting up and they come in. And of course, the walkers from the outside, drawn into the house by the baby crying. Um, that's important because they, again, yeah, they, they don't know where to go. They're just following the sound. So that worked. Uh, and then otherwise, yeah, nice big battle. Why people took so long to panic and start stabbing when they know they're being attacked again? Walking dead. I know hilltop people are a little bit protected as opposed to the Alexandrians and, and, and Ricks. Um, but when, when Daryl finally came in and started stabbing the people ahead, I was like, finally! All right, let's get on this. Now, as big as the battle was and as how much stuff happened, I have to say there wasn't a lot of real kind of standout moments. Uh, a lot of the stuff was sort of mixed with cool but messy or interesting moment but kind of effed up afterwards. Uh, there was one that really stuck uh, with me. So, of course, that will be this week's Scene of the Week. Um, and that is when Diane tells Maggie, when, Maggie, when they're out by the graves, and Diane tells Maggie that you're a good leader. She's already been hearing this. I mean, it's a lot of pressure to put on Maggie. But the fact that she doesn't even look at Diane and she starts going off about Negan, about the plans to get him there, sent him the box in order to, to, to pull him in. And, you know, I was hoping he was there. That's he's who I wanted to sort of end this thing, to finish stuff up. It was just, it was a small scene, but the camera was right in her face. So everything that was going on had to be held right there. And I thought Lauren Cohen did that 
beautifully. Just the fact that her eyes are constantly looking while she's talking. I mean, you can see, I mean, when the eyes move, they're accessing different as different parts of the brain. And, and, and that's what was interesting, is you can see that she is thinking, she is weighing out, as she said later on, the cost. Well, obviously, it gets bigger after this scene when everybody wakes up. Um, but still, kind of that, that idea of, of weighing out, am I doing the right thing? Am I a good leader? I kind of created the situation, I created this battle, and this is the price for what I wanted to do. I wanted to take out Negan. I wanted revenge for killing my husband. Um, anyway, it was just a small scene, not big, but really impactful. A lot of emotion right there. And again, it's just it was kept so tight right on Maggie's face, and I thought she just conveyed all of that questioning and confusion and commitment and, and, and weight of responsibility. There was so much processed in that scene and I thought she just did it beautifully. All right, just a couple of small things. Uh, one, of course, Carol and Tobin. We said goodbye to Tobin. Knew he wasn't gonna last that long. Honestly, I'm surprised he lasted as long as he did. Uh, but we did have that nice little moment, uh, I thought, between him and Carol uh, beforehand, talking about their relationship, uh, Carol saying, I was faking it! <laughs> but then it started to become real again. It's like, well, like you said, I think that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. I didn't want to fake it anymore. Uh, it was sweet. It was a nice, you know, it's great to have that little emotional moment, but of course, we just, we know what's gonna happen. The Tobin's going to be dead. Uh, and, and, and Carol's going to be alone, and she's weighing this. Do I stick with people? Do I move on? So Carol's still, I think, going to be carrying a lot of those questions coming after this, uh, now that she, in some ways, was starting to turn and maybe accept that there could be a possibility uh, of a relationship. Though I also loved how she told him um, that it's not about the end, that it's about just surviving. Maybe if, if we get through it, we can see another tomorrow. Um, he's looking for a big future. Carol has been in the fight long enough to know that tomorrow is often the best thing that you can hope for. You get it tomorrow, everything's good. As I mentioned before, really glad that Alden, our good savior, seems to now be fully uh, uh, in with the Hilltop community. It was, it was a great scene. I mean, I mentioned how much the whole Henry scene annoyed me there uh, with the prisoners and opening the gate and letting him go. But I did love that last little moment where Alden saves Sadiq, drops the thing, is like, look, I'm still here. The rest of the saviors took off, but some of us stayed and were trying to close the gate. And they do the pan over and just see all the saviors trying to, to put her, savior prisoners, ex-saviors, ex-saviors, trying to push the gate against the walkers. Again, it was just a cool moment, and I'm glad that we can, Maggie can start to see, kind of like that whole Dwight discussion, that just because you're with somebody doesn't necessarily mean you're with them. Oh, I love the signal in the beginning, all the horns honking. It reminded me of, like, uh, Lord of the Rings and such, and those old movies where they light the signal fires, and they see the fire and light the next one down, and get to the next one after that, and so on. Just hear horns. Um, not subtle. The Savior should have definitely heard that they knew that they were coming, but still effective. Oh, and Doc Redshirt, again, after she gives Sadiq that big angry speech, and he's like, look, I've been doing new stuff every day for the past two years since all of this started. Give me a break. And she looks at him and goes, I like you. No, no, you do not get to say a line. It's a stupid line. It's, God, it's so tropic. It's just... It's annoying. I'm glad she's dead. All right, well, I think that pretty much covers everything. So now there's only three episodes left until the end. We're going to have some revenge against the saviors. Jadis has Negan. I wonder where that's going to go. Um, and then, of course, eventually Morgan is going to take off. Maybe being haunted by Gavin's ghost is just too much for him. Uh, and he will have to take off because... He's going to leave here and head down to Texas to join Fear the Walking Dead. So, three more weeks. Hopefully, we will get this sort of wrapped up in a good way. I'm looking forward to it. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me with this review. 
If you enjoyed it, please go ahead and hit that like button. Thoughts, ideas, and comments, you know where to put them, down in the section below. You can always catch me on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Darren Jakes. Please subscribe if you're not. I know there's only three more episodes, but we've got Fear coming up afterwards. Plus, we're doing Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Legion, Westworld. I say this all the time. Be a subscriber. Don't miss any of them. Click this button and you won't miss any of that, that is. Uh, and I'll throw up a couple of our latest reviews right here and you can check those out. So, that's it for me. I'm D, and I'm out of here. Catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.